If you would take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to continue on in our series we've called Authentic Christianity. And we'll be looking at verses 38 through 42. Matthew 5, 38 through 42. Let me just kind of give you the topic right up front. The fact that the genuine believer in Christ is not characterized by vengeance. A true Christian is not characterized by a constant demand for justice. Instead, the genuine believer, the regenerate person who is truly repented, in whom the Holy Spirit has effected a radical change of heart, that a new man has come to reside, that person is characterized by what we might call a peaceful willingness to suffer injustice, to suffer pain. And this is a concept that the unsaved person really can't grasp. And in fact, the unsaved person is still under the retribution of God because for the unsaved person, this life is all there is. And and justice is something that you must make happen for yourself. There becomes a, a great desperation for some perspective of justice. But for the Christian, your perspective is completely different. That is, if you're in Christ. And this morning, I'd like to talk about this aspect of authentic Christianity, that the authentic Christian, the genuine believer, the regenerate person, is able to suffer for now. You're able to suffer for now. You're able to withstand injustice, and you don't take personal revenge. Now, I'll tell you up front that this message is basically eschatological in nature. That speaks of the study of the end times, the study of what comes next, including your personal end time. Why is the study of suffering for now really a study of the end times? Because the, the-, the key to the authentic Christian being able to suffer for now doesn't lie in the present. It lies in the future. And that now impacts how we respond in the present. The present solutions will fall short because sometimes they don't work out. Sometimes justice doesn't happen. In fact, I dare say, most of the time, justice doesn't happen. Someone who wronged you will never repent. Sometimes the one who stole from you will never repay. Sometimes the one who broke relationship with you will never restore that relationship. Sometimes the person who tried to destroy your reputation will never come around. And so the solution for the Christian in the present is to have a proper view of the future. And the result is that your actions now in the present are are changed. They become different. And of course, this is particularly important to our witness for Christ. Because the professing Christian, the one who claims Christ, but he comes off as vengeful, comes across as someone who takes revenge at any level, he does incredible harm to the reputation of Christ precisely because Christ gave his life so that you might avoid the vengeance of God. And so it's completely incongruent incongruent for a, a professing Christian to be vengeful, to have such a desperation for justice that they'll do anything and take it into their own hands. The unbeliever can't stomach what they view as injustice and revenge is the, the natural inclination of the self-righteous. But sadly, even in the church, revenge happens. Paul warned about this in Romans 12, and revenge can take many forms, forms not always called out as sin, even in the church. The revenge can take the form of shunning someone, of creating emotional distance, of avoidance, of gossip, of slander, of reviling, insulting, ruining someone's reputation, threats of, uh, of a subtle kind. These things happen in the church. This is the one who doesn't seem to care about making relationships right. The one who's constantly griping about my rights. The one who's constantly looking at offenses of others and not truly humbly examining himself. This is the one who's most prone to vengeance. And this is the one who ought to be fearful for his or her salvation. Now my plan for this morning is simple. I'm going to ask and answer three questions from our text. First question, what is Jesus teaching? Second question, how do I obey Jesus' teaching? And the third question, why can I have peace 
in obedience. So what is Jesus teaching? How do I obey Jesus teaching? And why can I have peace in obedience? And to help us answer that final question, we're going to have an extended visit with an old friend. And I'll tell you who he is in a few minutes. But we'll go back to the first question to begin. What is Jesus teaching? What is Jesus teaching? Matthew 5, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, and I'm going to stop right there. Jesus is referencing laws found in Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. And I'm going to go through those in detail in a moment. And as in other places here in Matthew 5, in which Jesus cites a Mosaic law and then says, but I say to you, he's not contradicting the law of Moses because the law is good, but he is providing new covenant law as well as correcting abuses of the old covenant law, correcting abuses of the Mosaic law. And the abuses of this particular law happened when Pharisees and self-righteous leaders would use this law as an excuse for personal vengeance, or at the very least, to treat someone that they feel wronged them with some sort of contempt and disregard. Listen, in, in Jesus' day, in first century Judea and Palestine, you didn't want to get on the wrong side of a Pharisee because he would make it his life's mission to make you miserable, and he would say, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Even in modern times, unbelievers will attempt to mischaracterize God and mischaracterize our Christian faith by claiming that the Bible teaches personal vengeance. Well, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So what are these laws about? Well, first of all, this speaks of the role of the leadership of Israel in exercising judgment on the evildoer. For example, Exodus 21, verse 24 that Jesus references, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The context is a punishment code, and this punishment is to be meted out by what verse 22 calls the judges. This is not personal vengeance. This is criminal punishment law carried out by official judges. Or consider Leviticus 24.20. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. Again, the context of these verses, both before and after, speak of the the official actions of the leadership of Israel. And in Deuteronomy 19, verse 21, Thus your eyes shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The context is, Three verses earlier, verse 18, is a court setting. Quote, the judges shall inquire thoroughly. So what laws are Jesus referring to? What he's referring to here are official injunctions by the state to cast judgment and punishment on a criminal. This is to protect society from lawlessness and from violence. Now, far from being some sort of cruel law in the ancient Near East, this law was a breath of fresh air. In fact, it was the only one of its kind, essentially. It was fair, and it gave us the principle that today we know as the punishment matching the crime. It gave us that principle. In fact, these laws were meant to to prevent excessive punishment. And let me just give you one example. In every other ancient Near Eastern culture, the law was very flexible because it had to take into account the social status of the person being accused. What do I mean by that? I mean that a slave was much more likely to get an incredibly harsh sentence such as death for simply stealing some food because he was hungry or trying to feed his family. He could be executed publicly. For the very same crime though, a a high-level official or royalty, uh, for example, if that high-level official had a son named something like Trapper or Hunter. He's likely to get away with terrible crimes and abuses of power with a little tiny inadequate sentence. But in Mosaic law, everyone is treated equally. The punishment was to be proportionate to the crime. It was incredibly just, incredibly fair. The law was meant to uh, prevent corruption 
and it was meant to be reasonable, giving the guilty person every opportunity in many cases to rebuild a normal life after repentance. So that's the background to the declaration of Christ here in Matthew 5. But as in the other declarations of new covenant law in chapter 5, he's insisting on the new covenant ethic that it goes even beyond this lifetime. Matthew 5, 39 at the beginning, But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Now to be clear, this is not a command to pacifism. This is not a command to never deal with evil in the society. In Romans 13, Paul says that the government wields the sword against the evildoer, that the government is to execute evildoers. What this is speaking, though, is the ethic against personal revenge. And just to drive this point home, Jesus gives five hypothetical situations in which the ethic of non-retaliation applies, situations which would have faced the first century Jew, and, and these are to illustrate his bigger principle. The first situation we could call the personal dispute. The personal dispute, verse 39, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. This is a very specific description. So you can picture this. This is a slap on the right cheek and it paints the scenario of a right-handed person giving a backhanded slap to somebody that they're angry with. Very insulting, very degrading, considered a a high form of insult. That's the personal dispute. And what does Jesus say? Offer the other cheek as well. How about the legal dispute? The legal dispute in verse 40, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your garment also. Now, this is describing a, a legitimate legal dispute in which the Uh, inner garment that you owned was promised as a pledge for something borrowed or maybe for a loan you took. Instead of fighting this, Jesus says, give him two garments. Give him your outer garment as well. Now, in a culture in which a normal person maybe had one and middle class had two changes of clothes and you were considered wealthy if you had five, to put a garment piece of clothing up as a pledge was a big deal. And yet Jesus said, if they insist on taking one, give them two. There's a third dispute we could call the occupation dispute. The occupation dispute. Verse 41, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two. Israel was under Roman occupation, Roman governance. A Roman soldier could demand that a Jew carry his equipment. And if he demands you carry his equipment for a mile, uh, some Uh, Historians believe that that was what was legally allowed. You say, no, I'll carry it for two miles. I'll happily do that for you. That you weren't to retaliate. There's a fourth situation we could call the benevolent response. The benevolent response, verse 42, give to him who asks of you. Give to him who asks of you. Now, this isn't a command to always give something to anybody who asks. That that would create chaos, right? But in context, it is a command to not withhold giving to someone simply because you're retaliating against them because you're angry with them. That you don't withhold from them as an act of vengeance, as an act of revenge. And in fact, by not withholding from them, that could actually help heal the relationship. And we'll see that in, in a few minutes. And then there's a fifth situation that I'll call the generous heart. The generous heart, verse 42, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. It's the same principle. This is not a command that you must loan money to anybody who asks. But if your reason to not help somebody in need, particularly to not help a brother in need, is retaliation or anger at that person, Now it becomes sinful. And now this is contrary to the New Testament ethic. And now, in fact, that is the very person who says, I know you're furious with me about this thing that uh, you're offended with me about, but can I borrow $100? That's the very person where you say, yes, I can. You, You may. So these are five situations. They're sample situations. What is Jesus teaching? What he's teaching is, is that If you are under the new covenant, if you have come to faith in Christ, you are compelled to be willing to suffer personal loss 
You're compelled to be willing to suffer personal loss. Why? Because you're in faith. You have faith in the Lord. God provides for your needs. But here's the bigger picture. You know that God will deal with injustice in his good time. He'll deal with injustice. And Jesus' emphasis here particularly is on individual relationships. That's what all those five situations deal with. Individual relationships. So he's teaching that you must be willing to suffer personal loss by faith, believing that God is one who provides your needs and God will deal with injustice in his own time. That's what he's teaching. So the second question is, how do I obey Jesus' teaching? What do I do? How do I obey this teaching? I want to consider that question with two simple categories. What not to do and what to do. And Scripture often presents these categories, so it's very simple for us. First of all, what not to do. Turn over to Romans chapter 12, and we get some terrific instruction on what not to do. While you're finding Romans 12, listen to what Proverbs has to say about what not to do. Proverbs 20, verse 22 says, do not say, I will repay evil. Hope in Yahweh, and he will save you. Proverbs 24, 29, do not say, as he did to me, so I shall do to him. I will render to the man according to his work. This is not justice. Justice happens by an official body, a, a, a group of elders in the church, a group of leaders in ancient Israel, a government. They're the ones who give justice. This is speaking of interpersonal relationships. And Romans 12 affirms this ethic of non-retaliation and tells us what not to do, specifically in the church. And how important was this for Paul? Well, he repeats himself multiple times here. Romans 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. In other words, you're giving the opposite of what you're getting. Verse 17, never paying back evil for evil to anyone, respecting what is good in the sight of all men. Then in the church, we never pay back evil for evil because the world is watching. And even the world, at some basic level, some unbelievers recognize that vengeance is wrong. And they might, they might not understand how to work that out in their own life. But if they see a Christian being vengeful toward another Christian, they're like, that, that can't be right. I thought Christianity was all about love and acceptance. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you being at peace with all men, that you do everything you can, and that would include humbling yourself and, and going to someone and saying, look, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're about 99% wrong in this, but how can I deal with my 1%? How, how can I help fix this relationship? What do I have to do? How do I have to humble myself? As far as it depends on you. Verse 19, never, never taking your own revenge, beloved. Instead, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's what not to do. We don't take vengeance. We don't justify treating somebody a little less kindly than we used to because we feel they deserve it. We don't justify treating someone with disdain because we feel they deserve it. Yes, there is the matter of church discipline, but church discipline is not to push somebody away. Church discipline is to draw someone to the cross and to draw them to repentance and to draw them in, not to excuse their sin, but to draw them into fellowship. That's what not to do. May no member of Grace Bible Church ever be characterized by vengeance. So what do you do? So what to do? We find this in Romans 12 also. But let me read you, first of all, from Proverbs 25, just to show that this is not original with Paul. Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and Yahweh will repay you. Paul reiterates this in Romans 12, verse 20. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. These are actions, loving with action instead of retaliation. Now, when we think of enemy, we tend to think militarily. 
I've actually heard the illustration that if the United States is ever invaded and soldiers are walking down the street, you need to give them bread and water and, and be kind to them. Okay, that's totally fine. That's another issue for another day. What's the context of Romans 12? In the church. Somebody who is treating you as an enemy. What do you do? You love with actions. And what happens? Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is not easy. What else do you do? I want to go to the Old Testament. Turn with me to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations is right after Isaiah and Jeremiah. Lamentations 3. When you suffer injustice, listen carefully, when you suffer injustice, this was part of God's sovereign plan and it is meant to sanctify you. It is for your good. It is for God's glory. It's to create trust in the Lord. It's to create a long view. It's to create trust in the Lord. Put it this way, beyond your lifetime. To humble you, to remind you that your hope is in Him, in Him alone. It's to create a situation where you won't idolize some sort of positive resolution. That you will worship God alone. Now in the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah the prophet wrote of the grief of the Jews in response to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And while the nation of Judah as a whole was judged, listen carefully, not every individual in the nation had been unfaithful to God. But they were caught in the crossfire of God's judgment on the nation as a whole. And so from a human standpoint, that would seem unjust. That yes, there were believers in Yahweh who lost their homes and lost their livelihoods, lost their homeland because others in the nation were unfaithful. And so it feels unjust. But Jeremiah tells the people, the survivors, particularly the young men, what their spiritual response is to be. And in fact, Jesus has cited part of this passage in his teaching in Matthew 5. You'll recognize it immediately. Listen to what the spiritual posture, the spiritual position of the one who has suffered what seems like injustice, what your posture is to be. Lamentations 3, verse 25. Here's the posture, and you're going to recognize something here. Verse 25, Yahweh is good to those who hope in Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that He waits silently for the salvation of Yahweh. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke, that that is the burden in his youth. Let him sit alone and be silent since he has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. Perhaps there is hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him. Let him be saturated with reproach. For the Lord will not reject forever. For if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the sons of men. In other words, God doesn't take pleasure in giving pain to the faithful, but it is for a larger purpose. Why can you present the other cheek, as it were, to the one who strikes you? Why? Because God is infinitely wise, he's infinitely loving, he's infinitely compassionate. And in fact, you already know what came right before this passage. Verse 22, the loving kindnesses of Yahweh indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Yahweh is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I wait for him. Leviticus 19 verse 18 actually puts what not to do and what to do all together in one sentence. And as a bonus, it gives us the reason for our obedience. Leviticus 19 18, you shall not take vengeance and you shall not keep your anger against the sons of your people. That's what not to do, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what to do. And what's the reason? I am Yahweh. What's the reason? I am Yahweh. Vengeance doesn't belong to you. It's mine, he says. What's the context of love your neighbor as yourself? The context is don't take vengeance on somebody you perceive as an enemy. 
Now let me take this logic a step further. You are not to take vengeance of any kind, even little tiny acts of vengeance that you might think are harmless. Why? Because you're not God. You're not in the position to punish a sinner because you are a sinner yourself. But to take it a logical step further, even God in the flesh demonstrated not taking vengeance. Jesus is God. He is worthy to judge. But what did he do? Matthew 26, 67, Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists and others slapped him. Matthew 27, 11, Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, You yourself say it. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? John 18, 22, And when he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby gave Jesus a slap, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? In John 19, 3, they were coming to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and were giving him slaps in the face. Peter describes Christ's response to this injustice. 1 Peter 2, 23, that Jesus being reviled, was not reviling in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. In other words, your day is coming. Today is not it, but it is coming. In fact, to take this even a step further, I want to give you a little insight into the torture, the whipping, the the. Uh, the degradation that Jesus went through and how he responded. Isaiah prophesied of how the Messiah would respond to the abuse and the torture and the whipping and the scourging of his accusers. And by the way, we're not talking about a little piece of string just kind of making the red mark on your back. We're talking about a scourging that turns your back into hamburger, absolutely destroying the flesh. But this is Christ himself speaking prophetically in Isaiah 50, verse 6. Just listen. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard, and I did not hide my face from dishonor and spitting. I gave. This is a perfect verb, essentially expressing past tense, and the English translation reflects this. And this is amazing. Try to wrap your minds around this. This is Christ speaking prophetically 700 years before his incarnation and his birth, speaking in the past tense, I gave my back to those who strike me. In other words, Jesus, knowing fully that he would suffer at the hands of unrighteous men, was already resolved to not shrink away, but to literally face his back toward those who were scourging him, to face his face toward those that were ripping his beard out and slapping him and punching him and and beating him with rods, to lean into it, to offer himself. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, in Hebrews 12, 3, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary, fainting in heart. In other words, you'll never have to deal with injustice like Jesus did. Because when you feel something is unjust against you, it's probably partially just. But none of it was just for Christ. See, Jesus had the eternal perspective. It's the perspective God outlines in Deuteronomy 32, 35. Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time, their foot will stumble. For the day of their disaster is near and the impending things are hastening upon them. First question, what is Jesus teaching? Second question, how do I obey Jesus' teaching? Third question, why can I have peace in obedience? Why can I have peace in obedience? And the the, the short answer is because every single injustice you've ever experienced every single injustice that's ever been committed will be held to account by God. It will be held to an account. In fact, take this a step further. Rather than being upset that you didn't receive justice, know that you will eventually receive justice. Maybe not in this lifetime, but instead of being focused on yourself, think about the one who has shunned God. Think about the one who has treated you with injustice who doesn't know Christ. I mean, if a a Christian, if a genuinely 
born-again person has treated you with injustice and you haven't received justice in this life. Hebrews 12 tells us that God will deal with that person in loving discipline, but at least everyone ends up in heaven together. But the unbeliever who's unjust, the government official who's corrupt, judges who let criminals go and condemn the innocent, the unbeliever who's been a source of pain and agony in your life, your attitude is that you can have peace in obedience because you can't even imagine the horrific justice that is coming toward the person that has offended you. That's the way bigger issue. Now, I said earlier that I'd like to visit with an old friend to help us answer this question, why can I have peace and obedience? And the answer is that every single injustice will be held to account by God. And the friend that I'd like to spend some time visiting with is our brother in the Lord, Jonathan Edwards. On July 8, 1741, he preached what some have called the most famous sermon of all time, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. In fact, his text was from Deuteronomy 32, 35, which we just read a moment ago. The King James Version that Edwards was using read, their foot shall slide in due time. Their foot shall slip in due time. I'd like to spend some time with our brother and be with him in Enfield, Connecticut when he preached this sermon for the first time. He preached it multiple times. But Edwards introduced his message with this statement. In this verse is threatened the vengeance of God on the wicked, unbelieving Israelites who were God's visible people and who lived under the means of grace, but who, notwithstanding all God's wonderful works toward them, remained void of counsel, having no understanding in them. Under all the cultivations of heaven, they brought forth bitter and poisonous fruit. And then he gave some initial helps to understand Deuteronomy 32, 35, He said this, the expression I have chosen for my text, their foot shall slide in due time, seems to imply the following, relating to the punishment and destruction to which these wicked Israelites were now exposed. And just giving you a short version, he says that they were always exposed to destruction as one that stands or walks in slippery places is always exposed to fall. This is implied in the manner of their destruction coming upon them, being represented by their foot sliding It implies that they were always exposed to sudden unexpected destruction and that as he walks in slippery places in every moment liable to fall, he cannot foresee one moment whether he shall stand or fall the next. And when he does fall, he falls at once without warning. That the reason why they are not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time has not come. For it is said that when that due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide. Then they shall be left to fall as they are inclined by their own weight. God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer, but will let them go. And then at that very instant, they shall fall into destruction. And then he gives the whole point of his message. He says this, The observation from the words that I would now insist upon is this. There is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. That's his main point. And to support that observation, Edwards made ten points, which I'm going to shorten somewhat and give you one-word labels for each of them to help you digest this. The first point, power. Power. He said, There is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Men's hands cannot be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. He is not only able to cast wicked men into hell, but he can most easily do it. Thus, it is easy for God, when he pleases, to cast his enemies down to hell. The second point we'll call deserved. Deserved. They deserve to be cast into hell so that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using his power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on the contrary, justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment of their sins. The third point he makes we could call condemnation. Condemnation. They are already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. They do not only justly deserve to be cast down thither, but the 
sentence of the law of God, that eternal and immutable rule of righteousness that God has fixed between him and mankind has gone out against them and stands against them so that they are bound over already to hell. The fourth point he makes we could call anger. They are now the object of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And the reason why they do not go down to hell at each moment is not because God, in whose power they are, is not then very angry with them, as he is with many miserable creatures now tormented, who there feel and bear the fierceness of his wrath. Yea, God is a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth. Yea, doubtless with many now in this congregation. He gives a fifth point we could call Satan. The devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them as his own. At what moment God shall permit him. They belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dominion. The scripture represents them as his goods. In Luke eleven twelve. the devils watch them. They are ever by them at their right hand. They stand waiting for them like greedy, hungry lions that see their prey and expect to have it, but are for the present kept back. If God should withdraw his hand by which they are restrained, they would in one moment fly upon their poor souls. The old serpent is gaping for them. Hell opens its mouth wide to receive them. And if God should permit it, they would be hastily swallowed up and lost. He makes a sixth point we'll call restraint. Restraint. There are in the souls of wicked men these hellish principles reigning that would presently kindle and flame out into hellfire if it were not for God's restraints. There is laid in the very nature of carnal men a foundation for the torments of hell. There are those corrupt principles in reigning power in them and in full possession of them that are seeds of hellfire. He makes a seventh observation we could call overconfidence. Overconfidence, and he hits this one hard. It is no security to wicked men for one moment that there are no visible means of death at hand. It is no security to a natural man that he is now in health, that he does not see which way he should now go out of the world by any accident, and there is no visible danger in any respect in his circumstances. The manifold and continual experience of the world in all the ages shows that this is no evidence that a man is not on the very brink of eternity and that the next step will not be into another world. The unseen, unthought of ways and means of persons going suddenly out of the world are innumerable and inconceivable. Unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering. There are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they will not bear their weight and these places are not seen. It's an eighth point he makes we'll call self-preservation. Self-preservation. He says, natural men's prudence and care to preserve their own lives or the care of others to preserve their lives do not secure them a moment. To this, divine providence and universal experience do also bear testimony that men are liable to early and unexpected death. It's a ninth point he makes we could call self-flattery. Self-flattery. All wicked men's pains and contrivance, which they use to escape hell, while they continue to reject Christ, and so remain wicked men, do not secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done, in what he is now doing or what he intends to do. Everyone lays out matters in his own mind, how he shall avoid damnation and flatters himself that he contrives well and plans well and that his schemes will not fail. They hear indeed that there are but few saved and that the greater part of men that have died have gone to hell But each one imagines that he lays out matters better for his own escape than others would have done. And he makes the tenth point I'll call self-delusion. Self-delusion. God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural man out of hell one moment. 
God certainly has made no promises either of eternal life or any, of any deliverance or preservation from eternal death, but what are contained in the promises given in Christ. In other words, the only promise God has made is that you will avoid hell if you are in Christ. That's the only promise. So that whatever some have imagined and pretended about promises made to natural men's earnest seeking and knocking, it is plain and manifest that whatever pains a natural man, whatever pains a natural man takes in religion, whatever prayers he makes until he believes in Christ, God is under no manner of obligation to keep him one moment from eternal destruction. That's his introduction. Edwards hadn't even started to make his application yet. He simply was explaining the seriousness of Deuteronomy 32-35 and he moved on to application. He said that the use of this awful subject may be for awakening unconverted persons in this congregation. This that you have heard is the case of every one of you that are out of Christ. That world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone is extended abroad under you There is the dreadful pit of the glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide gaping mouth open and you have nothing to stand upon nor anything to take hold of. There is nothing between you and hell but air. It is only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. You probably are not sensible of this but find you were kept out of hell. But you do not see the hand of God in it. But you look at other things. As the good state of your health, your care of your own life, the means you use for your own preservation. But indeed, these things are nothing. If God should withdraw his hand, they would avail no more to keep you from falling than the thin air to hold up a person suspended in it. Your wickedness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead. And to tend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf. And your healthy constitution, your own care and prudence and best contrivance or plans and all your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. He says, were it not for the sovereign pleasure of God, the earth would not bear you one moment, for you are a burden to it. The creation groans with you. The creation is made subject to the bondage of your corruption. He says, God's creatures are good and were made for men to serve God with and do not willingly subserve to any other purpose and they groan when they are abused to purposes so directly contrary to their nature in the end. In other words, the world is sick and tired of you as a sinner because it's because of you that the world is under a curse. And the world would spew you out were it not for the sovereign hand of him who has subjected it in hope. There are black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder. And were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you. The sovereign pleasure of God for the present stays his rough wind. Otherwise, it would come with fury and your destruction would come like a whirlwind and you would be like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And he puts it like this. The wrath of God is like great waters that are damned for the present. They increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. And the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty is its course when once it is let loose. It is true that judgment against your evil works has not been executed yet. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld. But your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing. And you are every day treasuring up more wrath. The waters are constantly rising. There is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back, that they're unwilling to be stopped and press hard to go forward. If God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate, it would immediately fly open, and the fiery floods of the fierceness and wrath of God would rush forward in inconceivable fury and would come upon you with omnipotent power. And if your strength were 10,000 times greater than it is, yea, 10,000 times greater than the strength of the stoutest, sturdiest devil in hell, it would be nothing to withstand or endure it. 
The bow of God's wrath is bent, the arrow made ready on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow, and it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. Thus, all you that have never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a state of new and before altogether unexperienced light and life are now in the hands of an angry God. However you may have reformed your life in many things and may have had religious affections and may have kept up a form of religion and in the house of God, it is nothing but His mere pleasure that keeps you from this moment being swallowed up in everlasting destruction. However unconvinced you may now be of the truth of what you hear, by and by you will be fully convinced of it. Those that are gone from being in circumstances with you, in other words, those that are no longer alive, See that it was so with them, for destruction came suddenly upon most of them when they expected nothing of it. And while they were saying, peace and safety, now they see that those things upon which they depended for peace and safety were nothing but thin air and empty shadows. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a rebel did his prince. And yet it is nothing but his hand that keeps you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell last night. That you suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. There is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone into hell since you have sat here in the house of God, provoking His pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending His solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop into hell. And he hasn't even started his plea yet. And he says, Oh, sinner! Oh, sinner! Consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of those in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and to burn it. And you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself. Nothing to keep off the flames of wrath. Nothing of your own. Nothing that you had ever done. Nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. How dreadful is the state of those that are daily and hourly in the danger of this great wrath and infinite misery. But this is the dismal case of every soul in this congregation that has not been born again. However moral and strict you may be, however sober and religious they may otherwise be. Oh, that you would consider it, whether you be young or old, there is reason to think that there are many in this congregation now hearing this discourse that will actually be the subjects of this very misery to all eternity. We know not who they are or in what seats they sit or what thoughts they now have. It may be that they are now at ease and hear all these things without much disturbance and they're now flattering themselves that they are not the persons and they promise themselves that they shall escape. If we knew that there was one person, but one in the whole congregation that was to be the subject of this misery, what an awful thing would that be to think of 
If we knew who it was, what an awful sight it would be to see such a person. How might all the rest of the congregation lift up a lamentable and bitter cry over him? But alas, instead of one, how many is it likely will remember this sermon in hell? And it would be a wonder if some that are now present should not be in hell in a very short time, even before this year is out. And it would be no wonder if some persons that now sit here in some seats of this meeting house in health, quiet and secure, should be there before tomorrow morning. Those of you that finally continue in the natural condition that shall keep out of hell longest will be there in a little while. Your damnation does not slumber. It will come swiftly and in all probability very suddenly upon many of you. You have reason to wonder that you are not already in hell It is doubtless the case of some of you have seen and known that never deserved hell more than you and now heretofore appeared as likely to have been now alive as you. In other words, it's amazing that you're even still here. You're so wicked. And now he speaks of those who have already gone. Their case is past all hope. They are crying in extreme misery and perfect despair. And then he addresses his church, but you here in the land of the living and in the house of God, you have an opportunity to obtain salvation. What would not those poor, condemned, hopeless souls give for one day's opportunity such as you now enjoy? And you now have, you now have an extraordinary opportunity a day in which Christ has thrown the door of mercy wide open and stands in calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many are flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God. And let everyone that is yet out of Christ and that is hanging over the pit of hell, whether they be old men and women or middle-aged or young people or little children, now hearken to the loud calls of God's word and providence This acceptable year of the Lord, a day of such great favors to come, will doubtless be a day of remarkable vengeance to others. And he says, if this should be the case with you, you will eternally curse this day and will curse the day that you were ever born to see such a season of the pouring out of God's Spirit and will wish that you had died and gone to hell before that you had seen it. And now undoubtedly it is, as it is in the days of John the Baptist, the axe is in an extraordinary manner laid at the root of the trees, that every tree which brings not forth good fruit may be hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore let everyone that is out of Christ now awake and fly from the wrath to come. The wrath of Almighty God is now undoubtedly hanging over a great part of this congregation Let everyone fly out of Sodom. Haste and escape for your lives. Look not behind you. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Do you understand why God says vengeance is mine? Vengeance is mine. Because he alone is holy. The authentic Christian does not take revenge. He doesn't have a vengeful spirit. And he's concerned more, much more, for the souls of those who have acted unjustly. My prayer for you, my prayer for our church, is that the fruit of genuine salvation be demonstrated in all of our lives to validate regeneration and the new heart from which only the repentant, born-again person may claim. May we be more concerned with those who are unjust than what it's done to us. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for being reminded by our great brother, Jonathan Edwards. We thank you for, of course, the greatest of all reminders from the lips of the Lord Jesus himself. That a genuine believer in Christ is not characterized by vengeance, not characterized by even little tiny acts 
of revenge. But instead, we are to love those that treat us as enemies. We are to pour heaping coals on their heads with deeds of kindness, acts of love. Because our greater concern is for the state of their souls, not ours. May the state of our souls be made apparent by our obedient responses to the word of God. May we look far ahead to the coming kingdom of Christ on earth in which perfect justice will reign, where our Prince of Peace will rule, where vengeance will be brought to the unbeliever and to the lost. May we trust in you and not in our own abilities. May we be characterized as those that can suffer indefinitely with perfect patience until that great day when you bring your retribution to the world. We pray in faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.